What's up, Melody Ever After? Coming to you live from a Hampton Inn. I feel like we all had those shows that growing up made us like Hershey squirt in our pants. Like these shows that were really disturbing and freaky, but they were intended for kids. And they don't really make shows like that anymore. I can't really think of a modern show or a modern animation that is for children and still really freaky. But when I was a kid, we were the generation that had all the freaky shows. We had Mr. Meaty. We had the misadventures of Flapjack. We had all sorts of stuff that our parents were like, oh, oh why are you watching that? I feel like it was also these really weird and borderline kind of creepy shows that also caused an entire generation to have this huge infatuation with horror media. And for me personally, I know this to be true. Whether it was R.L. Stein's A Haunting Hour or Goosebumps or something similar to that line, Are You Afraid of the Dark? I feel like everybody has that one show that really just sucked them in and made them a huge horror fan, if you are a horror fan. For me, Personally, that show was Courage the Cowardly Dog. My infatuation with Courage the Cowardly Dog runs deep. Courage the Cowardly Dog was this weird show. It had so many weird styles of animation. A lot of times they would throw in some random CGI or some random like imposition of like a real person's mouth or eyes on the monster. And my favorite thing is the sound effects. I, I literally, I wish I could recreate the Courage the Cowardly Dog scream. It's like the Wilhelm scream, but there's like a million variations of it. Ah! It's creepy, it's funny, it's off-putting, it's weird, and on top of everything, it's animated. And one thing about me is I'm either watching a horror movie or a cartoon, and there's no in-between. Do not ask me to watch reality TV, I will zone out. So today, in the name of nostalgia, I'm going to be ranking my top... That's what I thought. So today, in the name of nostalgia, I'm going to be ranking my top six favorite episodes of Courage the Cowardly Dog. I'm gonna be putting them in a bracket back to back to see which episodes creep me out the most and were overall my favorite. Usually the ones that creep me out the most were also my favorite. Probably to the dismay of my mother who had to deal with me not wanting to go to the bathroom alone for weeks at a time. I'm ranking these episodes based on the six core episodes that I remember the most vividly. I looked them up, I rewatched them, I took notes, I put them in a bracket and I have judged them and I have chosen the two that I think are the best. Now, at the end of this video, I'm gonna make a split decision and decide which one is number one. So stay tuned because I don't even know what number one is because I have two that I love so much. The first episode we're gonna be talking today is season three, episode 12, The Quilt Club. Now The Quilt Club was about these two people. They were twins who were conjoined. These two conjoined twins seeked out Muriel and asked her to join their quilting club, which is great. That is wonderful. Except for these two twins, Elisa and Eliza, were absolutely horrifyingly freaky. Um, not saying there's anything wrong with conjoined twins, but these specifically were really creeping me out. They had these long skinny necks that just popped out of the bodies. Like the proportions were really weird, even for a cartoon. It was, it was very troublesome. You later find out that this quilt club <laughs> encouraged a cowardly dog fashion is just as scary as you could possibly imagine. Turns out the quilting club isn't just about quilting fabrics, it's also about quilting people, which may explain why Elisa and Eliza are literally attached at the hip, or neck, or shoulders. Elisa and Eliza convince Muriel to join this quilting club, and they tell her that she needs to become a member, and by doing so, they try to turn her into a quilt. This was traumatizing for me, they literally, morphed her body into a quilt. And yeah, it was a cartoon, it was funny and everything, but think about that if that were like a real video. That would be absolutely horrifying. Me personally, I find this kind of stuff creepy. It's kind of teetering on the lines of body horror, and it really reminds me of, I don't know if you've ever seen The House, um, an anthology movie on Netflix. I, I believe it's still on Netflix, um, but there is a short animation about some of the characters in The House becoming so obsessed with The House that they become its furniture. And, and that is, it was horrifying to me when I watched that as an adult and the Quilting Club episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog is just as horrifying to me as a child. So for our first episode, we have a story about two conjoined twins who are probably stitched together somehow, convincing an old innocent woman to join their quilting club and stitch her into a quilt of their own. Starting off strong, next we have season four, episode seven, The Mask. I put these two together because they have similar vibes. This mysterious stranger shows up in all white cloaks and a giant mask with a woman's face 
painted on it, printed on it, something of that nature. And she comes in and she says that, you know, she's a traveler, she needs help. And so Muriel is like, oh dear, come on, let's let's go inside the house. Come on, oh, come on, dearie. And Eustace doesn't, either he doesn't give a shit or he's like an asshole about it, one or the other. But Courage, obviously, he's the one with the strong intuition. He sees something very creepy about this person. They have paws for hands. The hands are the only things that are visible behind the robes and the mask, and they have paws for hands, which is extremely creepy. The woman introduces herself, and she begins to stay with the family, and she shows this genuine distaste for courage, talking about how dogs are evil. I hate dogs. Dogs are stinky. Dogs are evil. Oh. And she's just like beating the crap out of Courage. Like she is beating the shit out of that little purple guy. One night, she takes off her mask and Courage is peeping through the keyhole and Courage finds out that this is actually a cat person. She is a cat, which despite the fact for him being an anamorphic speaking dog, he finds this extremely scary for some reason. I don't know if there's some kind of like animal hier hierarchy where like it's okay for a dog to talk, but when there's a cat woman, it's like not okay. I don't know. Typical Muriel and Eustace fashion, they don't believe him. So he steals a small trinket mouse from the creature um, now known as Kitty. And it says to Kitty love bunny on the back. And so Courage goes out to seek out why she's here to solve this mystery of what's going on. As it turns out, Bunny and Kitty were best friends and Bunny got in a relationship with Mad Dog who is this giant anamorphic dog who is like evil and probably a drug dealer who abused the crap out of Bunny. Um, very disturbing stuff for children's media. He was very verbally and mentally abusive to this, this rabbit. All she did was sit around and cry. It was very sad. But you know, chaos ensues and then Courage must face Mad Dog, reunite Bunny and Kitty and they live happily ever after. Number one, we all know Bunny and Kitty are dating, right? I know it's a kid's show, I know it happened in the 2000s, but even as a child, I was like, are they in love? And honestly, I ship Bunny and Kitty. I think Bunny and Kitty probably balance each other out and I hope they're very happy together. The scariest part about the story is seeing this abusive, toxic relationship between Mad Dog and Bunny and how scary of a place Bunny is in. She's juxtaposed against this horrible backdrop, this crack house looking place. And it's it's just really freaky to see such a cute character be stuck in this situation. And it distressed me as a child. I wouldn't say it scared me, but it did, it did give me some anxious feelings, okay? This was distressing as a kid, watching this giant grown dog yell at this cute little bunny. It freaked me out for some reason and rocked me to my core to this day. So now to get to the bracket. We have the quilting club and the mask. You know, these two are both really creepy. One is creepy in a way that is a more fantastical way, and the other is creepy in a more realistic way. Uh, so I did a lot of like consideration when I was thinking about which of these two would win and which one was my favorite, but I'm honestly gonna have to give it to the Quilting Club just because I feel like it stays more in fashion with Courage the Cowardly Dog's theme of weird and wacky and spooky, and it is more of a fantastical, children appropriate theme, I guess. Oh no, they're gonna quilt her into a, 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 they're gonna sew her into a quilt, you know, type thing, rather than, you know, having a child learn about toxic relationships and abusive relationships. That seems a little heavy. Um, not saying there's anything wrong with heavy children's media, but for me personally, I think that's why I'm gonna have to give my favorite to the quilting club. So the winner of round one, is the quilting club coming up for round two our first contender is season four episode 13 perfect the episode called perfect is about courage being put in this social situation with an elderly creepy decrepit professor and this professor is absolutely dogging on courage pun intended pointing out all of courage's flaws and mistakes and all the things he's ever done wrong and how he's this incompetent stupid character and it starts to give courage some internalized anxiety this causes courage to have some of these 
terrible, terrible nightmares that manifest into almost real entities. And the most scary part of these nightmares is that there's this blue CGI creature that really sticks out against the rest of the animation that the fans have dubbed the Bugle Monster. <laughs> And he basically lives in this giant liminal space that's all blue. And he just kind of floats around and he like has this like kind of lazy eye and he's like, you're not perfect. It was mostly the animation that scared me. I, I was like, whoa, why is it 3D? Why is everything, why is it 3D? And that scared me as a kid. So um, that's one of the reasons I was really scared of it. But also it was just really sad. It was a really sad concept seeing Courage so down on himself. Usually children's media has a lot of positive messages in it and sends these positive vibes to kids and teaches them about being confident, strong, smart, doing the right thing. Courage the Cowardly Dog from the get-go instilled accidental dread, self-doubt, and fear into children. And honestly, kind of here for it. Going up against perfect, we have season one, episode seven, King Ramsey's Curse. Here it is, every Gen Zer's favorite episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog. This one, I put up against perfect in the bracket because it also features a very strange spindly CGI character. This character being the ghost of the Egyptian king, King Ramses. Eustace somehow becomes the owner of this ancient slab and Eustace needs to return the slab to its original owner, AKA this like Egyptian ghost from a million years ago. And Eustace being the green annoying, selfish, abusive character that he is, is like, I'm not returning that slab. So he doesn't return the slab. Encouraged the whole time, he's like, return the slab. Anyway, so you know what I need. I think that this episode is definitely the most iconic episode. It's the one that I hear referenced the most. A lot of people, in their 20s, walk around and when they reference Courage the Cowardly Dog, they're always going, return the slab, return the slab. Fun fact about me watching this episode when I was a child, uh, I was watching it alone in the comfort of my living room, crisscross applesauce on the rug in my, in my living room, watching it on a big blocky square 2000s TV. One of those that when you put your hands up on it, you could feel the electricity like crackle on it and then your mom would be like, one of those. I was home alone watching this episode and I remember thinking, this is the scariest fucking thing I've ever seen. Probably not verbatim. I probably didn't think that as a child. But watching this episode alone, I was so scared of it. It was so disturbing. And my mom comes home from the grocery store. I think it was the grocery store because she had me go out to the car to unload groceries. And I put on a pair of flip flop slides and in the episode, it's like daylight outside and then Courage opens the door and it's like a portal to like this like spooky dimension that's CGI and the guy standing there like Return the slab Return the slab What? Return the slab Oh suffer my curse Yeah, so um, I was terrified to open the door and I remember standing at the door looking outside and I looked out into our front field because we lived on a farm and I'd be like, making sure no one was there. And my mom would be like, what are you doing? Go get the groceries. I've got to start dinner, come on. And so I tried to pawn my brother into getting the groceries and my brother was like, I'm not getting the groceries. So I was like, Damn it. and I was terrified to go out that door and get the groceries. Plot twist, King Ramses was not there. I lived. <laughs> I survived. It really did scare me as a kid. It was probably the most scary episode to me as a child. And there's a reason that it's so iconic and such a well-quoted episode. It was an amazing episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog. This brings us to round two. While I do find a lot of similarities in these episodes and their format, as well as the monsters and things like that, and me as an adult, I personally find this monster over here, the perfect monster, I tend to find it a little creepier, but as a child, I did not. So I'm going to have to give it to the most iconic Courage the Cowardly Dog episode, King Ramsey's Curse. Sorry, perfect. You were an amazing episode. You were good but you weren't perfect. 
Moving on to the final bracket, we are kicking it back all the way into season one, where we have season one, episode 11, Heads of Beef. So in this episode, it, it really it really stood out to me as a kid. I think it was probably one of the first episodes of Courage the Cowardly Dog I ever remember seeing. Um, in this episode, Courage and Eustace go out to get a burger. So they go to this diner and there are these giant pigs serving at the diner and they really creeped me out. The main pig, the, the chef pig, was named Jean Bon, and he'd say it like, my name is Jean Bon. I'm Jean Bon. What's your pleasure? And you know, it, it just, ugh, it really freaked me out. He had like yellow eyes and his, his little chef apron was really dirty and it, it really grossed me out. And then his wife was literally like, we're gonna make a cartoon of the, the idiom putting lipstick on a pig and then that's what she looked like. They're serving at the restaurant what's called heads of beef and they say it really weird. They're like heads of beef. Heads of beef. Specialty. <laughs> what is that? That's disgusting. Courage Cowardly Dog is sitting there and he's watching this guy at the diner. The guy at the diner is escorted to the basement or the bathroom or something like that. He goes out of the picture and then Eustace orders his head of beef and this plate is served and it looks like a meat head of the guy who just went into the... Anyway, um, so this definitely has some cannibalism undertones. This is probably some of the first implied cannibalism media I've ever seen in my life. A lot of firsts with this show. Um, Courage Cowardly Dog, thank you for christening my brain with lots of terrible ideas. Courage looks around and he's like, oh, 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 oh. And you know, doing his little Courage the Cowardly Dog thing because everyone around them is eating these heads of beef that look like the heads of the people who are eating at the restaurant. They look like they're fattening up people at the restaurant, taking them down to their little basement, and then chopping off their heads, cooking them, and feeding them to more people. That is the message that I got as a child. Um, how did this episode end? It actually had a very cute ending. I think that this is probably more how a lot of the, the it originally was supposed to end for a lot of episodes, how it was like kind of a Scooby-Doo thing where, oh, it was never real all along, you know, something like that. Eustace goes down to the basement. Courage gets absolutely terrified that they are trying to kill Eustace and, and serve his head to other customers. So Courage breaks in and it turns out they really were just having him try a new recipe of food. And turns out that the pigs were world-renowned artists that created sculptures of their patron's likeness in the form of beef. Um, beef medium sculptures uh, were, was not really on my bingo card when I was watching this episode. I really liked this episode because I found it really gross and really creepy and it it was, it was scary, uh, but not so scary that I was too scared to go get the groceries out of the car as a kid. This one, I, I knew that giant pigs didn't walk around and cook people. That was kind of, I was already past that point when I watched that episode, so I wasn't really scared of that happening. But now, an ancient Egyptian curse that could happen at any time. All right, the final episode, keeping with the food theme of Heads of Beef, I like to put these together because they both are surrounding food. I thought I'd give them a fair shot, is the King of Flan. So we have, you know, King King Ramsey, and then we have the King of Flan, or Flan, or Flan. If, if you know, how, if, I may be pronouncing that wrong. It may be Flan. Um, but Flan is what we've always called it. I'm from, the, I'm from the South, so we call it Flan. It's usually only in Mexican restaurants for birthdays. The King of Flan was about this television commercial where this creepy short little guy, AKA the King of Flan, would be like, Flantasy Flan. And what Flantasy Flan is, is a play on word of the word fantasy. Flan, um, which, you know, that's funny and all, but as a kid, I was totally mishearing it, and I thought he was calling it Flan Desi Flan, um, and I didn't know what Desi meant. I was like, Flan Desi Flan? What is Flan Desi Flan? I don't know, because I think he, like, had a German accent or something, one of those, like, European accents that we can't hear the difference in here in America. So basically these commercials convince Muriel and Eustace to go buy this flan, where Courage finds out that the people who eat this flan get severely, severely addicted to the flan and they can't stop eating the flan. This one I just found really gross. This is not some kind of like judgmental thing about eating, but like the sound effects. Oh my God. The sound effects in this were absolutely disgusting. Under my nails. 
Huh? Oh! The my nails! You know, Muriel became obsessed with this flan, and then eventually Eustace also became obsessed with this flan, and they just like ate and ate and ate, and they almost ate themselves to death. Like, the idea of this was that this flan was so addictive, you would eat yourself to death. That is, as a kid, that was a mind-blowing concept to me. I was like, binge eating disorder? <laughs> it really disturbed me as a child. Seeing Muriel and Eustace be so addicted to this flan really grossed me out as a kid. The sounds were all like that <laughs> kind of sounds, you know what I mean? We have heads of beef against the king of flan, the flan, flan, desi flan, as I thought it was as a kid. This one was pretty easy. I don't think a lot of people even remember the flan episode. It's not one of the most popular ones. I don't remember people. Oh yeah, the flan episode. That was just a me thing. A lot of people don't remember that. So I'm, I'm gonna give this to the obvious winner here. I'm gonna give it to Heads of Beef. Congratulations, Heads of Beef. You are moving on into the final round. So up next, we have the winner of the first bracket, which was the mask up against the winner of the second bracket, which is King Ramsey's Curse. These two, um, looking at them, they're a little bit more different. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm appreciating that we're getting some, some different themes going on here. We're gonna make things a little bit more spicy. Overall, the mask is about a toxic relationship between this rabbit and this, this dog. And there's this whole like sapphic friendship friendship between her cat friend. Come on, she's literally a cat. Her name is literally Kitty. <coughs> um, and to me, sorry, that's just not that scary compared to King Ramsey's curse. I mean, King Ramsey's curse had me afraid to open doors for like a good three week period. Again, sorry, mother. Um, I, I didn't tell you why I was doing that. I just was really scared to go outside. Sorry about that. Um, it's kind of like this time that I got scared of the gremlins franchise and was scared to go in the bathroom because I thought they'd be behind the shower curtain. So the winner of the second bracket, I'm gonna have to give it to King Ramsey's Curse. It's too good. It's too good. That leaves us with the winner's circle. We have Heads of Beef against King Ramsey's Curse. This is where it gets interesting because I purposely did not choose a winner because I thought expressing my feelings about all these episodes, the winner would make itself apparent to me at the end of the episode. But on one hand, we have the one that scared the living daylights out of me. This is like the Hershey Squirt factory for me as a child. Like this is, this was horrifying. And then we have the one that really instilled my love for the show. This was one of the first episodes I ever saw. It was creepy. It was definitely the first cannibalism media I had ever witnessed as a child. Um, I, you know, it, I, I think that this one specifically over here really developed my love for horror and my desire to do what I do today. So it's a really hard choice for me, but I think we're gonna have to crack it down to God, I don't know what we're gonna crack it down to. After careful and thorough consideration, I've decided which one of these two absolute disgusting little, little greedy goblin giggly monster men will reign supreme. And as much as I hate to do it, because I really, really, really like the other one, I'm gonna have to give it to King Ramsey's Curse. It's, it's too iconic for me to discredit. You know what I mean? Uh, Heads of Beef was really scary, like uh, for me as a kid. It was one of the first episodes I've ever seen, but I, it, it just didn't resonate with me as much as King Ramsey's Curse. That one bothered me for weeks. And I think for it to bother me for weeks as a child, that has to say something about how good it is, right? That has to say how impactful that this show was. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it to Ramsey's Curse. Sorry, Heads of Beef, you were an amazing episode. Thank you for your service. Thank you for everything you've done. I hate to be that person that gives the same ranking as like Watch Mojo and stuff because I know a lot of other people also think it's the best. I like to be different. I'm sorry, I am one of those people. I like to be quirky. Um, I, I do like to be quirky, sorry. Um, it's in my blood, it's in my nature. I know it's cringe. I'm not gonna apologize for it. If you've made it this far, which I know a lot of you probably won't, thank you so much for making it this far. I'm so happy to have you here. Genuinely, mwah, I love you. I hope you liked this episode. If you're interested in seeing more, I'd really appreciate it if you checked out my channel. I do lots of videos on things that are spooky, scary, horror movies, D&D. &D. I'm a pop culture commentary channel that talks about 
weird stuff, to be honest with you. I talk about strange things. So if you had a good time here today, keep, keep it coming. You've been watching Melody Ever After. Until next time.